So angiosarcoma is usually in the skin or subcutis. Most of the time it's superficial and it's on the skin. So it's a very important lesion for dermatologists and dermatopathologists to know about. And um, it typically occurs, the most common place that I see it is on the head and neck of sun-damaged elderly patients, often light-skinned or white patients. And here in Arkansas where I live, a uh, large portion of the population is elderly and white, and there's lots and lots of sun exposure here. People that have worked out on the fields or in the farm their whole life, and so many of them have extensive sun damage, and I end up seeing angiosarcoma in that setting. But another very important setting is that of uh, kind of iatrogenic uh, angiosarcoma. That is angiosarcoma that arises secondary to radiation therapy, particularly in the breast for, for breast sparing surgery for breast cancer, and also in the setting of chronic lymphedema, you can get angiosarcoma. So those are very important um, settings. And it can also occur in deep soft tissue rarely and also in, in, in the internal organs um, in the right atrium, which is a classic place for angiosarcoma. It's very rare, but if you see a right atrial mass, it's angiosarcoma until proven otherwise. And then the liver and spleen at the site of vascular grafts, those are some different places. I actually saw a splenic angiosarcoma very recently. Um, and young patients and kids, I used to teach people that, that young patients never get angiosarcoma. But as we, as we often know that whenever you say never in medicine, you'll usually be proven wrong eventually. And I've now met a few young patients and, and kids through, I, I work with an angiosarcoma support group on Facebook, a patient support group. And I've met some people that were quite young, um, including a guy who's my age that has angiosarcoma. So you, you, you can have it, but you should be very, very, very cautious. Um, and I would argue maybe even get expert consultation always before making a diagnosis of angiosarc in a very young patient or a child. Um, I would probably still send a case to another expert to, to see before making a diagnosis in a child just because it's that rare. So microscopically, here's what an excision of angiosarcoma looks like. And when you have this kind of specimen, the diagnosis is not very challenging. When you have a tiny biopsy, of course, it can be a lot more tricky. Uh, here you can see big nodules of tumor down in the deep dermis and also some kind of infiltrating tumor up uh, in the superficial dermis and off to the sides. And going closer, this is the classic appearance, these infiltrated, connecting, ramifying vascular channels, and they're dissecting in between the dermal collagen bundles. And if we go in for a closer look, you can see that the vascular channels are lined by markedly atypical endothelial cells. They have very hyperchromatic nuclei, and they have a tendency to begin to multi-layer or pile on top of one another. Vascular spaces are supposed to be lined by one layer of endothelium only. And when you start to have multi-layering of the endothelial cells, coupled with infiltrative growth like this, you must be very, very concerned for angiosarcoma. But sometimes the angiosarc looks like this, and you can see that these endothelial cells do not look very atypical. But the vascular channels are quite infiltrative here, and that's something to give you concern. But you have to take, use a little bit of caution because sometimes some angiomas and vascular lesions or, or even vascular malformations can have the appearance of infiltrative growth like this. So you have to be very cautious and you have to use the clinical context and, and some other clues to help you. Um, so here, when I um, look, you can see that the individual collagen bundles are wrapped completely by endothelial cells. That's a very worrisome feature. Um, for angiosarcoma. Kaposi sarcoma, which we won't really talk about much today, it also can do that. And so it's important to, to know that and to distinguish angiosarc from Kaposi. Usually the clinical setting can help you there and HHV8 immunostain as well. So looking though at that same, when we go up to lower power on this same case, what you can see is these infiltrating channels, even though they look kind of almost cavernous and very bland, look where they are. This is normal breast ductal elements. And you can see that these channels are infiltrating all the way down into the breast parenchyma. And of course, this is a post-radiation um, patient for a, a, a breast cancer. And so this is an angiosarcoma infiltrating the breast. It's very well differentiated appearing. Um, and so these can be quite tricky to diagnose, especially on a small biopsy. All right, so let's take a closer look. You can see that the endothelium is beginning to kind of multi-layer a little bit. They're kind of getting clumps and clusters of endothelial cells, and that's a helpful clue. Here's another picture also. See the, the multi-layering of endothelium? That's a very useful clue for angiosarcoma. So even though there's not terribly uh, prominent atypia, there's infiltration and there's multi-layering, and both of those things are important clues to the diagnosis.
And uh, this is the same case again. And look, this area here has the kind of well-differentiated, bland look that I was just showing you. And you can see over here as well. But look at this large nodule. When you go closer to that, you can see that that well-differentiated appearance is transitioning into very cellular, very nasty, high-grade looking angiosarcoma. So you can, have, uh, you can have a variety of patterns even within the same lesion. And here's another case of angiosarc, and when you just look at this power, there's no blood-filled spaces, there's no hemorrhage, there's nothing here to suggest that this is angiosarc. Even though I took this picture, if you showed this to me in a, in outside of this lecture, I might look at this and say, oh, that's undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, or what, what used to be called MFH. It doesn't look like angiosarc here. So I think the take-home is that angiosarcs can sometimes have um, solid cellular areas, but usually when you look around, if you have an, a large enough biopsy, if you look out to the periphery, you'll find some areas of more classic angiosarc. I've never seen an angiosarc that looked completely like this, but I have seen cellular solid areas um, in many cases of angiosarc. It's usually a relatively focal finding, though, and you can find the vascular channel formation out at the edges. So um, I think, though, anytime you have a kind of epithelioid, funny-looking tumor and you can't quite classify it, always consider doing a vascular marker because uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes the angiosarc can be deceptive. So here's a case that's much more cellular and atypical, and you can see, though, that there are some extravasated red cells out here, and there are some vascular channels. So even though there are other areas that are solid, like I just showed you, you can see vascular channel formation. And look there, very infiltrative um, vascular channels, markedly atypical um, endothelial cells with huge nucleoli, very useful uh, clues. And um, the, amp the uh, cytoplasm of angiosarc, particularly when it becomes epithelioid angiosarc, is often this kind of grayish blue or purple, this amphiphilic cytoplasm. So anytime you see a tumor with amphiphilic cytoplasm that looks malignant, always think about angiosarcoma and consider doing a vascular stain. So an update that's, that's of interest is that several years ago, uh, Thomas Mensel and uh, his group, uh, they described uh, the presence of a CMIC amplification not, not translocation, but amplification in the setting of post-radiation and post-lymphedema um, angiosarcomas. So sun-damaged, typical angiosarc on the sun-damaged skin usually is negative for CMIC, but post-radiation and post-lymphedema angiosarc often has amp uh, amplification of CMIC. So this is a very curious and interesting finding, and diagnostically can be useful. You can use fish to detect semic amplification. So in the setting of post-radiation, where you often have unusual vascular changes that are just benign, and sometimes on a small biopsy, it can be quite hard to tell um, if there's angiosarcoma or not, you can utilize semic uh, fish to try to help you. Um, and oh, I just explained all that. Sorry, I, I looked through these slides before, but sometimes I get ahead of myself. Um, so it's a, it's a very sensitive and specific marker for angiosarcoma compared to benign vascular lesions. Um, and here's an example on the, on, this is a figure from Mensel's paper. On the right, you can see your negative control, two copies of MIC, as you would expect every normal cell in the body to have. But here, the angiosarcoma cell has multiple additional copies of the MIC gene. So it's a similar concept to, like, to how HER2 nu is amplified in breast cancer or MDM2 is amplified in well-differentiated liposarc. It's that same kind of uh, pattern where you have multiple additional uh, probe staining uh, compared to normal. All right, so angiosarcoma, as I mentioned earlier, is a grave prognosis. Um, many of the patients will die within less than 12 months of diagnosis, and the majority of patients will eventually die. So it's a terrible diagnosis, and because of this, you know, we have to be careful to never give this uh, diagnosis lightly, always be totally sure, um, and I mean, I know we always try to do that as pathologists, but if I'm wrong about saying something squamous cell carcinoma or not, probably the patient is not going to die because of my mistake. If I'm wrong about saying whether or not something is angiosarcoma, that's going to be an enormous difference for the patient um, in their treatment and, and in, in their prognosis. And usually these are aggressively treated with surgery. Um, chemo and radiation are used sometimes, and, um, but not usually with great success. And the problem is that even when you do aggressive surgery, it's very common to have recurrence. And that's because these are blood vessel tumors. They have access to the vasculature from their, their inception. So from when the tumor arises, it automatically is, is able to invade the vasculature and spread. And so it's very easy for this tumor to recur locally as satellite lesions. It's easy for it to metastasize distantly. And like most sarcomas, distant metastases often end up in the lungs. So we'll talk briefly about the, um, the pitfalls. Clinically, there are a variety of pitfalls that we need to know about with angiosarc. 
it can look a lot like a bruise or solar purpura because elderly sun damaged people tend to get bruised patches on their skin. So if you see an area that looks like a bruise or solar purpura that's not going away or that's ulcerating or that's getting thicker, you should consider doing a biopsy to make sure it's not angiosarc. A small biopsy, of course, may not be representative. We always know that this is a problem with pathology that we, we run into. So I think that what I tell to the dermatologist, though, is that if a small biopsy comes back as a benign vascular thing, but if you clinically are very worried about something being angiosarc, you need to repeat the biopsy. Don't just trust that it's negative just because that small biopsy looked negative to the pathologist. And you need to talk to your pathologist, of course. I think I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Most of you know how important it is to, for the pathologist and the dermatologist to talk. But I think anytime the path report doesn't fit the clinical, but especially with vascular lesions, talking to the pathologist is important. I think another thing that clinically in dermatology we're probably not doing as well as we should is we're not educating patients about the need to examine their radiation sites or examine their areas with lymphedema for any changes that could look like angiosarc. I don't think we necessarily need to tell every patient, hey, there's a risk you're going to get a deadly vascular tumor. You know, I don't think we need to raise excessive worry. Most patients with radiation do not get angiosarcoma. It's relatively rare, but I think it's good for us to let people know if they see changes in their skin at the radiation site, they should get um, a, an appointment and see their dermatologist immediately. So, and I think also most dermatologists, when I ask them, do you examine your patient's radiation sites on um, your general skin exam? Most of the answers I get are no. Most dermatologists are not thinking about this actively. Think about how many patients, those of you in the audience who do see patients clinically, think about how many patients you have that have had breast conserving surgery and, and radiation for breast cancer. It's very common. So I think it's important that we keep an eye out for this. Um, to hope, you know, there's not proof that early detection um, improves survival, but I think it can't hurt to detect angiosarc early. And that we've got to start somewhere um, in helping to fight this disease. So the pitfalls on the pathology side are, of course, a small biopsy with incomplete clinical history is a recipe for the disaster. And so, you know, I always say, to, you know, pathologists need to talk to their dermatologists if they don't know the clinical scenario for a vascular lesion, especially if it's breast. If I see a vascular lesion on the breast, I almost always will call and get a history. Is there radiation? How big is this? What does it look like? Even if it looks like a benign hemangioma to me, because in the setting of the breast, I'm always extra careful because I know how common it is for patients to have breast radiation. Um, some forms of hemangioma can look like angiosarc because they can look infiltrative, but looking at the low power picture and also the clinical history are very helpful to sort this out. And um, Kaposi sarcoma can sometimes mimic angiosarcoma and vice versa. I've seen very spindled angiosarcs that look almost identical to Kaposi, but like we mentioned earlier, there's a completely different treatment and prognosis. Kaposi is not usually treated surgically. Um, in the setting of HIV, we try to treat the immunosuppression um, and, and you're trying to get their immune status better to fight off the HHV8 infection. Um, but usually big surgery is not indicated, whereas for angiosarc, surgery is the mainstay of treatment. So the, fortunately, we now have the HHV8 um, immunostain, which is very useful and can really help you. And anytime you have a, any doubt about um, Kaposi sarcoma, just do an HHV8. And if it's negative, it's very, very unlikely to be Kaposi. So I think that's very helpful. But you can have infiltrating vascular channels in Kaposi, um, so that can be hard. But, and the other thing is that Kaposi usually does not have the severe nuclear atypia that angiosarc has. But it can sometimes. It just usually does not. All right, and then finally, epithelioid angiosarc looks like other cancers. It looks a lot more like a carcinoma or a melanoma. It can look like epithelioid sarcoma. It can look quite different, and it often expresses keratin. Uh, but again, the treatment and prognosis is very different for epithelioid angiosarc versus these entities here. So it's really important to, uh, to keep epithelioid angiosarc in mind anytime you have an epithelioid lesion that you're not sure um, how to classify. So here's an example, epithelial angiosarc. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I've seen metastatic melanomas all the time that look very similar to this. But note that blue-gray cytoplasm. It's a really useful clue for epithelial angiosarc. And these dishesive cells that are falling apart and leaving blood-filled spaces, these are not really well-formed vascular channels, but anytime you see epithelioid cells floating around in pools of blood, think about angiosarcoma. And it's easy. Just do a couple of immunostains to exclude it and uh, to avoid making a huge uh, mistake diagnosis. So here's uh, the problem that I mentioned, though. Epithelioid angiosarc expresses keratin oftentimes, as sometimes up to 50% of them can express keratin, uh, just like carcinoma does, just like epithelioid sarcoma. And again, those are very different diseases.
And uh, here's an example of CD31, the strong membranous staining that you'd like to see um, in angiosarc. And you can use other markers like ERG. ERG is a nice nuclear marker for um, endothelium, and I really like it. I use it a lot. And if you're debating about um, uh, epithelioid sarcoma, you can use INI1, which will be retained in angiosarcoma and most other tumors, but lost in epithelioid sarcoma. So here's an example of ERG. It's beautiful nuclear stain. It's very clean and relatively specific, although um, epithelioid sarcoma can sometimes also express ERG, and prostate cancer often expresses ERG. So there are a couple of other things, but overall I think ERG is a really useful marker. 